Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 18. This week on the show, we have Armin Ronaher to talk about the first 10 years of Flask. Armin talks about the origins of Flask and the components that make up the framework. He talks about what goes into documenting a framework or API. He also discusses the community working on the ongoing development of Flask. He shares his thoughts about Python and the contrast with languages like Rust and TypeScript. Armin also talks about what he would do differently if he were to start development of a project like Flask now. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Welcome to the podcast, Armin. Hello. I wanted to ask you a little bit before we get into the history of Flask, a little bit about what you're doing currently at uh, Sentry. Yeah, so what am I doing currently? So my, my current role is, is called Director of Engineering. And more or less what I'm doing is um, actually, in a way, running the Viennese branch that we have. Okay. So Sentry, is, uh, at the core of it, is an open source project, the crash reporting tool or application monitoring tool. And it started as an open source project, and it really still is. We have a base in San Francisco where most of the development happens. And then we have a subsidiary in Vienna where we do most of the SDK development and what we call interest and processing. And I'm making sure that all of those things work well. Uh, It's actually quite an interesting area to be working on because we basically make sure that your crash makes it to our service so that we can show you why your stuff crashed. Okay. But we also have to support a wide range of platforms like C, C++, probably soon WebAssembly. And there's a lot of like interesting engineering that happens to, to make that work. Yeah, I can imagine it sounds pretty complex that you can support so many different languages and frameworks kind of under, underneath that. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting field, specifically because you see, like for instance, if you, I don't know, if you have an audio processing problem and it's like a simple audio processing problem, you can probably Google your solution. Yeah. And there are probably enough people that are into audio processing that Googling is an option. With like crash reporting, for some odd reason, it seems like a lot of people really like having crash reporting tools, but they don't really care about how it works. And so a lot of the problems are just very hard to Google, or they're only ever the same three, four people showing up that have the same problem. So it's a very tight-knit community of people that seem to care about debug formats and, and stack unwinding and memory dumps and all of that stuff. Uh, yeah, this is a it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting thing. It's like I feel like almost every company in the last couple of years has built in-house crash reporting tools, but typically not really sharing it outside. And and yeah, there have been only a handful of companies that actually did uh, venture into the open with their with with the problems. I th- I think of with businesses, there's that same kind of problem with like train employees, and they get to know you know, the, the whole stack of your software and everything like that. And then they eventually leave and all that institutional knowledge goes to. And in a way, this is a- analogous to what, what you're talking about there. That Yeah, it's super common that we're in a in a conversation with a larger company and they're like, yeah, we have this crash reporting tool, but the guy left. Yeah. And now we don't know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and just the idea of maybe having a way to share it across yeah. a, a service like that sounds... Sounds pretty cool. And it's also like, you know that I really like open source. And one of the interesting developments has been that when we started with specifically um, C++ crash reporting, we started using a lot of stuff from Mozilla because they wrote it for Firefox. Yeah. Um, and Mozilla actually used a bunch of stuff that Google wrote. And so we we, we are really living, um, what do you call it? Like on, we were standing on, on giants in the beginning. <laughs> and now it's really nice to see that some of the... yeah improvements that we made to that stack. Specifically, we are writing a new library in Rust, uh, which does a lot of this, has now been picked up by Mozilla again. So it's really nice to see that 
once you start actually working in, in that space and provide something for other people, uh, all of a sudden the contributions go in the opposite direction, which is very nice. Yeah. And if somebody wanted to get involved in using Sentry, it looks like it's possible because it's open source, if you're like an individual developer that you can you can use the tool too, right? Yeah. And specifically for crash reporting, we also have a separate open source project that deals with the nitty gritty details of how it works. So if you if you don't want the crash reporting solution, but you really like working with crashes, uh, we also have the underlying open source libraries, which are usable and hackable by itself. Cool. I was listening to a previous interview you did with Talk Python and Michael Kennedy. And I think it was about five years ago. And it sounded like that it was about right when you were starting at Century. Is that correct? I don't remember when it was. But uh, I started at Century five years ago, I think. A little bit more, yeah. Okay. At the time, you were also working with, in sort of the video game world a little bit, with the fire team. Yeah. Mostly kind of building the, the communication services and, and online services for games. Is that right? Yeah. So I worked a couple of years in London, directly employed by a company called Fireteam, but it was a part of um, Splash Damage, which is a game development company. And Splash Damage in itself had contracts with other game companies too, as like a, so, I mean, not necessarily outsourcing, but sort of as a contract basis. At that time, mostly did networking for games, but then I also helped with, like the last project I worked on was, was the Halo Master Chief Collection for Microsoft through Fireteam, where we tried to fix the matchmaking stuff and, and do some stuff there. Yeah, so not doing much with games these days, but we're at the moment at Century working with gaming companies quite a bit yeah. to improve their game crashing experience, okay. <laughs> crash reporting experience. So yeah, this year probably going to be heading a little bit back into games because we're trying to get console support going. Okay. So would that be for the new consoles that are kind of coming out soon? The PS5 and the... It's so weird name. Uh, two. I, I think just generally, because this is a field that we okay. have custom interest in, but we haven't okay. touched much in the past. Yeah. One of the reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast is to sort of talk about the history of Flask. And I guess the anniversary, have the date right, it was uh, May of 2010. And so you're at 10 years here. Mm-hmm. A couple of questions on that. First would be, how involved are you with Flask currently? Yeah, that's an interesting question. <laughs> it's an interesting question because the same way as Flask turned popular in sort of a gradual uh, way where I didn't really see it happen. Okay. Sort of the same way happened as community maintenance took over. So I'm doing very little these days. In fact, I I mostly disassociate myself from like things that are happening there because okay for wide variety of reasons i still hang out in 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 the discord that goes with it i sometimes still check up on issues but yeah i'm i'm not that active in in flask development but not because of flask as much as it is just that i moved a lot into sort of the rust community and with that just my my overall focus on on python got got smaller and yeah that more than than that I didn't really like Flask anymore. Just that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You were talking about Rust a lot in that previous interview, and I was wondering, I, you know, I was looking and saw you'd done a variety of talks, kind of talking about your your like of Rust and your still love of Python, and are you kind of still moving back and forth between those two languages primarily? I use every language for I think the purpose that I think they're good at. Flask, uh, sorry, Rust is an awful language for a lot of things. So uh, Django, um, the Django framework, is what most of Sentry is built on. Okay. We also have a service that's written in Flask. And so on a day-to-day basis, there's a lot of Python code I'm still touching. Okay. Yeah, so there's there's, there's a lot of Python in my life still. It's just that I'm mostly working on the interest side of Sentry at the moment. And that's very high-performance kind of area where Python is just not a great choice. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I think like it's it's also like so obviously my my uh, focus has shifted, and with that, my use of Python has changed quite a bit. But I've also noticed that the general community around Flask has also it's different now than it was ten years ago. Yeah. And I I I definitely I feel less 
understanding of a customer's needs in that sense around the Flask ecosystem now than, than 10 years ago, when I understood what the average developer was doing. Now it's, it's very different. That kind of brings up two things I wanted to talk about. Let me just start with the first one. You said in jest, right? Mm-hmm. The, of bringing in data for, uh, for Sentry itself. What are the advantages that Rust has there? It's- um, I mean, there's a very, very obvious one, which is it's just it's fast. <laughs> It's 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 concurrent. It's it's parallel. It's okay. It's it's like all the things that you want. It's also type checked. It, it's it feels like a good language to solve this specific problem that we have, right? Which is get a lot of data into the system very fast. Sure. I don't know if it's like the most productive language, but I think most of the people that are touching the Rust code base at Century generally really like working with the language. Maybe not all the time. They're for sure they're very frustrating experiences, but it, it feels like a well, well-rounded well language. So I think that's a pretty good language to pick for this type of thing. Sure. Yeah. And and I mean, there's the second part of it, which is just that it also, it's a new language. So it has me- it had the ability to learn from a lot of mistakes from other languages, um, which is just really nice because you're like, it's it's not just fast. And all of those things, it has like a perfect package manager. It has it has so many things solved that even after years, Python still doesn't have solved. And so that that just makes it overall like really nice. But again, it's it's a much more it has much more cognitive overhead. Sure. Okay. It's harder to get started. So yeah, it's it's a different beast altogether. It's very it's not comparable in any way. <laughs> no, that makes sense. So kind of going back to the origins of Flask, I, I know that you know it was built on several of your own projects as kind of a starting point. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Like, Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably reasonable to talk about like why does this thing exist in the first place? Yeah. So if you go all the way back to probably 2004, <laughs> yeah. I, I learned programming and probably earlier, but in any case, I discovered Linux, specifically Ubuntu Linux. I was living in Austria, language of choice was German. There was a German community for Ubuntu people and it ran PHPBB. That's how it all started because I started hacking around on this PHPB installation and I had this idea, it would be really nice to have like a Python, uh, a Python form software. Okay. And so I wanted to start writing that. But unlike with PHP, PHP, where in PHP you can just or at the time, you, and it's still the case, you, you have a file called foo.php, you write echo hello world in there, and then you put it there and it just open that file via the browser through the indirection of Apache, all of a sudden the code runs. Okay. And in Python, at the time there were maybe CGI scripts and stuff, but it was because Python, like you wouldn't write Python like PHP and expect it to work because like, oh, then the CGI thing would be slow. So then you would do fast CGI, but fast CGI all of a sudden is persistent. And there's like all this other logic. And it also, instead of just executing from top to bottom, all of a sudden you have state and stuff. So it was, it was very different to all the, the, the Python web ecosystem was just not very developed. And just around that time, there was this thing called WGI, which was a specification about how to abstract across these different deployment scenarios. But it was just a PEP. There was no real implementation. It was just all kinds of, there were some theoretical implementations, but it really didn't take off. Okay. And Django was about to be released. It was actually released. And Django just completely ignored WGI. It just, it just had a mod Python handler that it implemented itself. And I think it had a fast CGI handler. It had a bunch of stuff, but it, it really was just built around mod Python. And I just said like, I want to have my own version of this and I want to just write a base implementation for for WSGI so that I can build this form software. And so the first thing I built was a bunch of like WSGI tools right? Uh, that eventually I I learned more about programming, I learned more about HTTP and everything. And so a couple of iterations later, this thing landed as this library called Werkzeug, which is literally toolkit in German. And yeah, so I wrote that one. And then because I really like the parallel Django development, I really like the template engine, so I wanted to make a better version of that. Okay. And I built Jinja. And those two things together, I just used for my own purposes. 
and you didn't I didn't feel like I need a framework. I can just use them myself and I can do some stuff. But eventually you start any building up the same sort of router, even though it was kind of integrated in Vector. But you build up this, this this framework all the time yourself. And not everybody really appreciated that. Like a lot of people didn't want to build a framework around this. And to to implement the tools that you had built, you mean? Yeah, to 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 configure them together and make and make it easy to to like your a little bit more complex thing than Hello World. And so there were a bunch of frameworks developing in addition to Django. Like obviously it was Turbo Gears, but it kind of disappeared. Yeah. And then was Web 2 Pi. There was a framework called Bottle. And one thing that some of them had in in common, especially Web dot Pi, uh, and Bottle, is that they had this thing. It's like, hey, is is this one file thingy? Zero dependencies, everything in there. And I, I was just confused, I think, by this idea that you don't, that no dependencies is, is, is like a feature. I found this okay. not, not understanding, uh, because like kind of monolithic, like all in one versus yeah, I, separating. I, yeah, it, it didn't really, Python packaging was not so broken that that was a necessity. And so um, I just, for a joke, uh, bundled uh, Werkzeug and uh, Jinja into a zip archive, Base64 encoded it into a Python file, and then built a mini framework around it. And so you had this one file, which was a framework plus the two dependencies bundled. Okay. And so if you imported it, it's just imported into this embedded zip file and then imported the other stuff out of it. And I made a fake screencast for it. I had a friend of mine record like the audio for it. And it just had this like April Fool's version of one file framework that just bundled my other libraries. Aha, uh-huh, I can make the same thing <laughs> kind of thing. But the thing the thing that I learned through this really ridiculous April Fool's joke is that there was actually like the libraries, people actually said like they're pretty good, but they're too hard to use. And so actually building this 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 framework around to to actually make him easier to use, even though I didn't feel the necessity for it, actually helped other people use it. Yeah. And so that's really how Flask started. Flask was just a way to make the underlying libraries easier to to work with. Cool. Yeah. And so initial uses were, as you were saying, a sort of a bulletin board forum kind of thing to be able to to build something like that and not have so that was my use but but it actually turned, it's like okay. the reason why i always felt like this this framework thing to be ridiculous was that i came with this idea into into the sort of software development like i would like to build something like PHPB, some software that you can install and you put it on your server and then you run it, you run your own installer, you have your own configuration system. You don't want the framework. It was always my idea. It's like you, you, like I also, for a while, I contributed to a, a system called Track. I don't know if people still know this. It was a bug tracker. And there, there was this time where you build software that other people would install on their servers. And f- in all of those cases, hmm. having a framework sounded like that's not what you want. You don't want this massive Django thing. You don't want this massive Flask thing, which has its own config system, its own everything. So I felt like, hey, like there must be a lot of other people that have this problem. But it turns out most people don't actually have this problem. Most people don't build software that other people install. Most people build something for themselves that they're going to install on one server, and they don't care if there's a framework. So that realization really only came after I didn't just consider my own problems, which were centered around things that people really don't really had as as a massive problem. Mm. In a way, it's kind of funny because Sentry has that problem, right? I work at a company now that, that does have Django mostly seen as an inconvenience when it comes to the configuration aspect. Because it wasn't built for the tool? No, it's not that, it's not that Django is a problem, but like okay. you have a Django settings module, you have this Django config thing. In a way, it would be nicer if there was like a Sentry-specific config and all of this Django stuff just is abstracted away. Uh, we, in fact, build a custom config system around it and everything. Right. So you don't really see Django much in, in, in the Sentry okay. setup if you if you run it yourself. Okay. Did, did um, all these sort of early realizations, as you, you put it out there, change your focus for your development at that time then? I'm not sure. I, I think at one point, I just started really appreciating that people used Flask. And so... Okay. I think for two two years or so, I started just working to solve other people's problems. All right, what kind of problems? 
like I think a, a bit was like composability, a bit was just improving the like quite a bit of work by improving the error messages that you would get if you do something wrong, or I worked on this this improving this debugger that you have when when something happens. Like there was a bunch of work that went into making it easy to serialize JSON out and stuff like that. The interesting part is that um, like time change problems around you change a lot of what okay. work that went into Flask, especially a couple of years ago. I'm not sure it's like that relevant to nowadays, right? Because people built so much more JavaScript UI. So all the in quotes innovations that went into the change templating engine, maybe not so useful anymore. But yeah, I, I just spend a lot of time trying to, in in a way, like discover problems people have, and then also trying to figure out how how to solve them. Yeah. And 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 to be quite honest, I mean, it sounds really boring, but a lot of what I did back then was just learning how to how to build stuff. Chincher, for instance, is like I don't know the how many version of a templating engine I wrote because I didn't just build a Python template engine; I also wrote a PHP templating engine. And right. because I I wrote Jinja and then I felt like, oh, like I'll, now I would do it differently. <laughs> <laughs> and then wrote a slightly different version for PHP, which actually got surprisingly popular in the PHP world. And then I came with some of the learnings from then and then went back to to fix a little bit more in, in Jinja. Yeah. Well, isn't that primarily, you know, I think of Jinja being used inside of Django. I'm sure it's used in lots of other uh, web frameworks. So the most... So it finds that if you if you take like where did the community move to, right? So the Flask community, I think, moved a lot into the data science world. But then if you take, for instance, Jinja, where did Jinja move to? Okay. Well, so as people in the Flask world, maybe they still render templates, but as they moved into um, doing a lot of stuff in React, mm. there was a, all of a sudden a completely new user of Jinja, which was the ops world. Okay. Both Salt and Ansible for server configuration started using Jinja as a programming language for configuring servers, which was a development that we didn't really foresee when I wrote this this thing. And so, like a lot of the changes that later on went into Jinja, for instance, actually came out of this newly found world of of server configuration, which was not envisioned in any capacity originally. Sure. So that's like a whole like subset of syntax then that that would send these instructions. It's not that the syntax changed much, but for instance, if if someone wants in and said like, "Hey, I'm, I want to evaluate a Jinja expression," okay, um, and get the result back, that was originally not really something that Jinja was optimizing for. You could kind of do it, but it was a bit of a hack. And so then eventually, Jinja gained this ability to evaluate an expression, and get mm. get the result back. It was, it was designed to be more one way before, like a display kind of thing before. It was a, like you render. A template and you get a string back. It was not you you calculate one plus one. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you would maybe calculate one plus one and then render the result into the template. But it was not like you evaluate one plus one and you get two back as an int as an integer two and then put it into a YAML config. Yeah. Right. Okay. That that kind of thing is that is like something that specifically happened for yeah. For for the use of, of Ginger and Ansible. So that you mentioned one kind of unique use of like kind of more recent users, what were some of the other earlier users primarily using Flask for? I feel like, I mean, I, I don't know how good my recollection is here because it's already a couple of years back, but there was at one point, uh, I don't know, maybe that was, maybe it was even earlier, but for sure there was a move from you do everything on the server and you render out some HTML to you produce a bunch of JSON. Sure. And then you have a bunch of other things that talk to it. And when people started building more of these somewhat semi-independent APIs that talk to each other, Flask got to be a reasonable choice, I guess, to build this kind of stuff. Okay. So I remember there was a lot of people that really just used Flask to do very basic, I have some stuff in a database, I want to do some calculation on it, and I'm going to give you this response via the JSON API. Yeah. I could think of a use I had for that where I would use it for, you know, data visualization kind of stuff. Yeah. Or just especially yeah, that. Just read data in. Yeah. Draw, yeah. Especially like data data science kind of kind of situations is super popular. I've I've seen people serve up 
TensorFlow models with it. I've seen people consume TensorFlow things and then visualize it with Matplotlib or or whatever you have. Like there's a lot of this. Right. And then like little microservices that people build to 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 do something in the infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I, at this point, I've seen this thing almost everywhere. <laughs> For me, the, the 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 most interesting uses of of Flask have actually never been when someone told me like, "Oh, Company X uses it in X Y Z." It's like, okay, cool, might believe you or not, or it's like it has absolutely no impact on my life. But what was really always interesting is when I saw that someone started doing a university course where Flask was in, or yeah. when I saw like someone printed a physical book with Flask in it. It was like, oh, all of a sudden it feels way more real than yeah, that's interesting. knowing that someone at Pinterest used it. Yeah. But I think of Miguel Grinberg's, you know, not only the old blog post he had, uh, but his books. And what's funny is he, he's kind of building a, a bulletin board service, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> as, as the main project, right? <laughs> yeah. Where did the term pellets projects come from? So there was an original project called Puku, Puku, however you want to call it. That was originally the name for the bulletin board we wanted to build. And then since we never finished building this, uh, we just repurposed it for uh, Georg and me and a bunch of other people. Okay. So Georg, friend and colleague of mine, he and me, we built not just Flask and Chincha. We also, like, we each of us had their little um, uh, project that we were most interested in. But... For many of those, we, we actually cooperated. Um, so he also built Pigments, the syntax highlighter, and Sphinx, the documentation tool. But we also okay. worked together a lot on this. Oh, cool. And so when when this project kind of went independent ways, I felt like n- neither of us have sort of the right to this Puku name because like we were both of it, but then we kind of... I basically stopped contributing to pigments and I, I stopped contributing to Sphinx and, and he stopped contributing to mine. And so I felt like, okay, so this needs a new name kind of kind of arrangement because I wanted to get other people involved in it. And there were obviously, there was not just Flask, there was Flask and Backsuck and Chincha and It's Dangerous, one of the other libraries that it sits on top. And so it felt like, okay, it needs a new name. Sure. And since I was still very much convinced that what was nice about Flask is that it's built on top of these other utility libraries that can be used independently, I was looking for things that that play a role in shipping stuff. Yeah. And one thing that conceptually, uh, especially because I like economics, I really like is Euro pallets. I don't know if you anything, know anything about them, but Euro pallets are basically standardized uh, wooden pallets that you can stack stuff on, on top. Okay. And what makes your pallets interesting is your pallets are working like a currency. And I found that concept so fascinating that that I felt like, okay, that's that's pretty reasonable name to, to, to describe software that you use to ship things. Yeah, it's used in shipping, <laughs> shipping your software. Because like it was fascinating about your pallets is, and that's like complete aside, has nothing to do with software engineering, is that when you buy... I don't know, flour or something like this in bulk. Sure. You don't just buy the flour. You indirectly also buy the pallet that it's standing on top because the pallet has some value. Right. And so the pallets, when you then ship something else back, there's no expectation that you're going to send the same pallet. You can send another pallet. So people trade these pallets across like as, as part of, of what, what they ship the stuff with. It's really quite fascinating. So I found this an interesting concept and I found that yeah. to be worthy of naming another thing <laughs> well it's kind of funny it can kind of becomes meta when you think about the container architecture of uh docker yeah so container would have been a good name but that was already used so <laughs> right no but i mean in the sense that you're you're shipping <laughs> software that is used as pallets inside of these container objects inside of docker you know as far as the metaphor goes i'm sorry maybe i'm stretching you yeah <laughs> I, I see it's like you built your own stuff on top of pallet called flask yeah, that's cool. Did you study economics or is it just a kind of a side hobby? Uh, it's a side hobby. It's a, it's a big hobby of mine. It didn't study anything, but yeah. Okay. Huge hobby. Okay, cool. And this may be a weird question, but I was just wondering about development of Flask and the versioning number. And, and it's become a bit of a trend in the Python world, at least, of having versioning numbers uh, of zero point whatever to a certain point and then eventually hitting like a 1.0. Was there a specific reasoning? or a specific point for 1.0? Yeah, there was. So I wouldn't say there was a specific point for 1.0, but there was a reasoning why it was 
why it stayed at zero point something for a really long time, which was that when I started doing open source development, okay, it f- I would say it felt different than I feel like open source development is happening now in the sense that I didn't really in any way consider this to be professional, to be putting it bluntly. When, when I released my first open source libraries, okay. I think it was 17 or something, and it didn't feel like it didn't feel like I want to communicate that this is something that you should build your stuff on top. Uh, it felt like, oh, I'm I'm just experimenting here. I want to give myself the freedom to just to to change my mind. Mm. Eventually, I realized that yeah, and eventually I realized that it doesn't really work that way. You have to you have to guarantee stability, even if it's a zero point something, because otherwise it's just annoyed a couple of people that are willing to to use it. And if you don't have users, then it, it loses the fun. But in my mind, I still felt like for a long time, it's like, hey, yeah, this is just me doing stuff. Sure. So I just keep it there, <laughs> just for safety. And then eventually it was just like, oh, it's staying there for like a year and I've almost not changed anything. Okay. So might as well get it done. <laughs> that's that's literally the only thing that happened. Um, okay. It's like, okay, yeah, now it's stable, I guess. And then the f- 1.0 release broke a whole ton of stuff. But <laughs> 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 I don't know. Uh, that's funny. It, it's kind of weird because I, I think like Flask in, is now maintained by, by a community. And I know that the community thinks about things differently than me. I was... I learned not to break things. And I understand that this is an outsider's opinion in the Python community. But I always was super careful with breaking stuff. I, when a user misused an API, I, was, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't break things unless I had a really good reason for breaking it. When I broke it, I'm, I sometimes wrote scripts to auto-migrate. I, I did a whole bunch of stuff to, to do that. And largely because I understood that if you, if you build something that is not just a dependency of the end user, but it's also the dependency of a dependency, then in Python, you really don't have a choice to have that dependency to be a different version. So you need to be consistent. You need to have something that works for everybody. Yeah. So I was always super, super careful to do that. And I know that especially with like this move to Python 3, that sort of thinking is a lot less I don't know if it has majority support at, anymore in the community. Okay. So that's that's definitely different now. You feel that Python 3 in some ways is moving fast, not necessarily faster, but willing to potentially make breaking changes to move things forward. I think the community as a whole just doesn't care anymore about okay. backwards compatibility as, as the primary driver of stuff. And it's not just Python 3. It's like pip and 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 like... Many of the the pillars of the Python ecosystem are in a, in a, in the mood right now to just change a whole bunch of stuff. Mm. Probably that's necessary, but I always felt super uncomfortable for this. Sure, and the versioning for sure exemplified this quite a bit. Okay, that makes sense. That kind of brings up a thought I had, and I, I'm sorry I didn't do the research on it, but I wanted to learn a little more about Python two. Point seven is still being supported in current versions of Flask. Is that right? So I don't know if the release version supports it, but the the master version doesn't. This is also one thing that I'm for sure not in agreement with because it's not that I think people should be using two point seven, but okay, I was always willing to extend the support for old Python versions for a really long time. I remember I supported there was a Python two point four was one of the major ones because they added decorator syntax. Okay, and I kept support for two point three for such a long time, so that uh, even though it made the code base uglier because it couldn't use decorator syntax, yeah. But it, I, I just, I always felt like that's like something that I care for, and I, I was, I was even appreciating sort of the constraints that it put on me, and 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 right, okay, in a way, the fun that it caused to build code that worked across a bunch of versions, especially when it went to working with the standard library. There were often times when you had to be quite clever in in how you can use the standard library so that you get the, the same output independent of the Python version. Yeah, but the community now is thinks differently of this, so it's it's it only supports a bunch of Python versions at this point. Okay. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's about an important step in the development and sharing of your code. The course is titled "Documenting Python Code: A Complete Guide." 
The course is based on a real Python article by author James Mertz. In the course, instructor Andrew Stephen takes you through the reasons that documenting your code is so important, the differences between commenting and documenting, best practices for doc strings, and additional tools, references, and documentation projects. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn the best practices for documenting your code and to learn about tools like Sphinx, which we discussed during this week's episode. And like most of the video courses on RealPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections and you get code examples for the techniques shown. Check out the video course. You can find the link in the show notes or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. So you mentioned the community a couple times now. Do you have an idea of like the size of the current community working on Flask? So in terms of actual active maintainership at the Pellets Org, I think has about 10 people on it that, that contribute. Okay. And then like the wider wider community of, of people, I have absolutely no overview of, of, of what it is. <laughs> yeah. I, I know that we used to have this, this cool ISD channel, which was pretty active. And at one point it was one of the largest ones on Freenode. And now like I'm not even on IRC anymore. I just hang out on on, on the Discord sometimes. And yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just about 200 people sort of hang out in there doesn't seem too significant in that in the discord but then i look at like how many people actually use it in the world yeah and it seems to be a pretty big number yeah no as as i had doug farrell on the show he's a author writes at real python but he works for shutterfly um, i'm not sure if you're familiar with that but it's a it's like a printing company they you know not only print like photographs but they print you know your photographs on stuff and so he uses flask internally lots of these machines where it's never even going to the wider web it's just for these machines to talk to through intranets to other things like that and so he's building these really simple apis and he definitely uses it a lot for that those kind of purposes so i i think that there's a lot of sort of a hidden <laughs> architecture that's using it just because of some of the simplicity of setting it up yeah for sure there's there's a lot of that so i noticed that there was a change in that you're you guys are using black now as a code formatter for flask are you a fan of using code formatters mixed opinions i would say okay so i do think it's a good idea that you have code formatters and i enforce it rigorously on the rust code base and javascript code base i'm working on i also really like black and i enforce it on the python code bases now too that we have okay but i think they're mixed back yeah, it's so the the thing is that I I never felt like the the Python code, I think code formatting matters a whole lot, in languages like Rust in particular, or Go or Java. I never really felt like code formatting matters that much in Python because you kind of sure we are indentation based anyways. So for as long as you agree on four spaces, that's kind of okay. What Python never could agree on was like capitalization of anything. Classes are lowercase sometimes. Yeah, so. I, I really wish the community would have started linting API names. That felt like that's where the focus should have right. been. It's very open. Yeah. The code formatting is also nice to have, but in comparison, like I think it feels a little bit less important. Yeah. So I, I wish Python would start enforced uh its its naming scheme somehow. Okay. And that kind of maybe leads into something that you like a lot about Rust, which is uh type checking. I know that there are movements in Python in general, and you know Guido is obviously involved in this with his involvement in MyPy and a lot of the newer peps that are kind of coming along with Python 3.8 and Python 3.9 involve type checking. What are your thoughts on that? On on type adding more type checking to Python? I I like type checking. I think it's a great thing. I just completely disagree with Python in how it does it. Okay. So I like. In, when it comes to dynamic languages and type checking, I think it's hard to beat TypeScript. Mm. TypeScript type erasure kind of approach is amazing for this type of language. Can you explain that a little bit for me? Because I, I I haven't worked with it at all, and I would guess a lot of listeners haven't. So if you, if you take TypeScript as a language, sure. what it does is it adds a bunch of type annotations that sit on top of the JavaScript language. And um, A, you can add types to anything, even if it's untyped by itself. I know that you can do the same in, in, in the Python world, but all the types that you add in TypeScript, they are compile time only, with the exception of enum clusters. 
which means that all this stuff that you do completely disappears at runtime. It means, for instance, that you can have really complex circular dependencies of types easily. You can you can express things without any runtime impact. You can annotate everything, variables, uh, return values, arguments, you name it. Mm-hmm. And it just compiles down to plain old JavaScript. So the, the that means two things. A, the languages can evolve independently, which is important. JavaScript could be itself and TypeScript can be itself. Yes. And it also means that you can do innovations independently. You can learn about this is like, these are the things that people have problems with. So you can evolve TypeScript to do these things better. Okay. Python can't do that because Python A decided that types should be runtime refer- reflected. Um, so it means that if you import certain types, they're just objects that sit there. So you, you pay the cost of that all the time. I know that there's all kinds of tricks where you can have this if my pie, then sort of deferred type checking and so forth. But it's just, it really feels like a hack. Um, and it is a hack. Mm. It also has caused the situation where you need sometimes a language update to get new types. So you need just you don't just need to update your typed language. You also need to update the to a new Python version. Right. Then there's MyPy has very different setup than um, if you take IntelliJ for instance, or what's called not IntelliJ PyCharm. Yeah, they're type which then is different yeah. from like Dropbox's type checker, and then different from the typing from the standard library. So it's just a mess of stuff. Mm. Very hard to understand, and incredibly slow. Like. My Pi type checking, it I don't know if you can make it any slower. That was like that's always my like the disappointing part about typing in Python is that it just felt like there was a really nice innovation called TypeScript. If the community would have looked at that and learned something from it, could have been a better outcome, I feel like. Okay. That makes sense. So one of the things that I really appreciate about Flask is the documentation going on the website and viewing seems really detailed and with examples and so forth. And I was wondering how much you were involved in in that. I know it's been 10 years, so there's a lot of phases that's gone through. Yeah, so I like document, documenting, still like documenting. I worked with Georg on the original Sphinx tool for documenting stuff. So that was always something that I cared about. And more so after Flask was initially released. So I think my qualities of documenting stuff went up a little bit there. There are definitely some things that I, I I have some relatively complex thoughts about how documentation should be structured now. Okay. So for a long time, I really felt like prose is sort of how you should do most sort of. I don't know if the Flask documentation is a good example for this, but I think I did a better job with the click documentation, which is this command line library that I wrote, where I structured the documentation based on common topics, which hmm. are loosely following the API. Okay with like interspersed examples. So for instance, like... So it reads more prose-like then? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So I, I was not a huge... Back then, I was a huge fan of API documentation because I felt like if you if you look at the API, there's like there can be so much surface area. How do you know which one to look for? I still think that's largely true. But that's also because Python doesn't have a good way to shape the API. So it's kind of like everything is public. And so I felt, especially in Python, you better not start auto-documenting stuff because you're accidentally going to expose things that you didn't want to expose. I still think that API documentation is a terrible idea. Mm, Okay. I saw with TypeScript and with Rust recently that you can actually shape your API maybe to reduce the total surface area and then API documentation becomes somewhat acceptable. I'm sorry. When you say API documentation, are you saying that as you've written the API itself, written the the code, you're potentially going to use a tool that's going to help you in auto documenting it in in some ways, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's one part, but the other one is that say you have like twenty classes or something, or let's just say functions. You have like twenty functions. They're just sitting around somewhere in a documentation. They have doc strings that go with it. How do you communicate the relationship between these? And I felt like. That's a documentation problem. Okay. For a long time, I felt like that's a documentation problem. And so, if you look at the Flask documentation, it like it has API documentation somewhere, but it kind of groups it by topics. Hmm. Nowadays, I feel like if you even have this problem in the first place, yeah, 
that you feel like you need to solve this in a documentation, maybe there was already a bad API in the first place. Like maybe there's maybe the, the, the fact that it felt like you had to group this, maybe it should just expose too much API. And so nowadays I feel like probably most libraries just expose too much API. Mm. And it would be better for everybody if it would expose less. And then if you expose less API, then the document documenting that API also becomes less of a challenge because the fewer surface area there is, the fewer surface area that needs to be documented. So that shaped my thoughts on documentation somewhat in that I feel like okay. API documentation is more defensible now than I felt like when I started documenting Flask and other libraries. Okay. So it's it as you as you started the process of documenting it, you've kind of evolved your you're you're thinking on it, and click is somewhere in the middle of that process. Um, I think it's closer, at least, to what I would do nowadays. Okay. I, Flask has too much API. Click also has a lot of API, but com- comparatively less, or at least the API that exists feels better grouped on the API level. So you have you have things that logically belong together. But yeah, it, I I think like hmm. API design and documenting it belongs closer together. I, I f- at least now I feel like it belongs closer together than I felt like when when I started sort of this these projects of documenting things. Yeah, that idea of of not exposing every you know part of the API is interesting to me. That that I could see that people would then potentially maybe from a design aspect maybe they're putting some form of importance on these things that to you as a developer feel like these are just underpinnings and workings and you shouldn't be really messing with that architectural stuff because you're it's not going to be as efficient and not work as well as what your intention was is that some of it uh, for me the biggest thing is that i used to be believe very much into this idea of like onion apis okay where you have like all these low level utilities and then you have like this higher level wrapper around it but you can always go into like the inner workings and poke around there. And I still think that's a good idea to have, but I would logically separate them much further apart nowadays. Okay. It's like I would probably still give you access to the underpinnings, but I would probably give you less stability about these underpinnings. Like if you poke around in them, <laughs> expect that major upgrades of the library were going to be more painful. Yeah. But I would also just maybe even move them into a separate library. That makes sense. At the very least, I would move them far away enough from the rest of the surface of the API that it's very obvious for you that you're poking around in stuff that's yeah that's different. I have a couple of questions, just kind of general Flask questions. Are you happy where it is right now, where Flask is right now? Yeah, I think Flask is in a pretty good spot. Would you, if you were going to develop Flask, you know, or, or a project like that from scratch right now, what would be a first step that you'd do differently? If if I do it in 2020, yeah, <laughs> I I wouldn't build it again. <laughs> I, I wouldn't build it again because okay, it, I, I first of all I solve my first my problems first, and then I solve other people's problems. And my first problems are just I don't necessarily need Flask for that anymore. In in the sense that like I'm working at the moment at a company that processes a ton of data, <laughs> so mm. less Python, right? Yeah, so this is probably what I would start with. But then it's like, okay, so the goal is to solve, like you build, uh, let's say like you you go back to this idea, it's like you, you want to solve this type of problems that you have, yeah. but you probably also want to solve something that's sort of on the zeitgeist. Those are the problems you need to solve. Yeah. The type of problems that people have at that point in time. And the people that, the problems that people have in 2020 are just different than the problems that people had in like 2010. Yeah. So I feel like if, if I look now in sort of what does the world need, the world doesn't need another Python framework. There are plenty of them to choose from. Yeah. So I probably would like, would look elsewhere. And I probably wouldn't build like a Python framework. I feel like at this point, okay. I, I would probably want to build a, f- somewhat I don't know is it a framework a system that helps you build more distributed data processing problems like data pipelines that kind of thing and probably in more than one language at the same time because mm, okay, it's unlikely nowadays that people just build stuff in one language only yeah well, that's something you, you see with with the usage of Flask as you were saying earlier that so many people are using it as a as a basis and then yeah 
you know, connecting it to a JavaScript front or yeah. something. I'm I'm just generally really excited about where WebAssembly is going. I feel like maybe there's a future where almost all of our languages are going to have some sort of WebAssembly interpreter in there, and we're going to load common WebAssembly modules and have a bunch of our logic outsourced into that one. Hmm. I think it's a it's it's a not unlikely future for a lot of a lot of what we're doing. I had a listener question a little while back that was interesting and and I don't know if you have a perspective on it you you can refuse to answer if you don't want to get into it but I thought because you had a little background in PHP or actually probably quite a bit of background and then moved into these other languages so this person works in WordPress and still is kind of a beginner and then was very interested in like how they could implement python with WordPress and I thought to myself I don't really know of a way to do that for PHP that it feels, especially like a, a system like WordPress, it feels kind of to me that it would be difficult to connect it to frameworks like Python. Um, but I don't know if you had thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, so the thing is that, so the first thing is, um, I think that the first thought that comes to mind is there are no stupid questions. Because sure. I, I remember when when I started doing like a bunch of these things, I was just generally negative on this type of, Thoughts because like oh there's like that they, they don't just fit together right this this idea is like instinctively no you can't do that end of end of conversation but like <laughs> I think this is this is just a lot more ambivalent now because like for instance I I know that there are a lot of people that do kind of things like that so for instance if you take so let's just go back a couple of years it was very common people just hosted a WordPress site somewhere. Right. And wrote their blog posts and blah, blah, blah. And then um, it, it came on Dick when it still existed, or it came on Slashdot when it was still popular. And then it was popular and the site went down, right? Very, very common thing. But mm. not just that, it was also super common that you would encounter a blog and there was like something was off on the site. There was like, there was content on the site that surely was supposed to be there. And it turned out it was because there was a WordPress installation that wasn't updated, had like a security hole in there, and then someone just defaced the site and put some spam links on there. Right. So anyways, what's the point of the story? The point of the story is that nowadays, people just feel a little bit iffy about having dynamic content for something that's largely not dynamic, especially because people just don't really want comments on the internet anymore. They much rather embed... Facebook comments or just give up on comments entirely. So one thing that I've noticed that people do quite a bit now is that they have like this workflow built around WordPress, but they don't want WordPress to be actually serving content to customers. Relatively popular thing now is to use WordPress as an editor Mm. for some stuff that you maybe feed into the database or you pick it up somehow. And then you have a separate system that might be written in Python that picks up the data and renders it out on a static page. Okay. And like a, a, a even more common setup, I believe, is people uh, using Drupal oh, okay. to then render stuff out with Gatsby, for instance, uh, like this JavaScript static website generator thing that uses React and stuff. So that's like the most obvious thing in which you can combine these. Like mm. you use the WordPress yeah. user interface to give your content editors a decent experience, but then you just consume the data in Python and yeah, and maybe use change your templates or something to render it out, and then have it process it. Okay, cool. I know a lot of hosting options are out there for you know things where your you know digital ocean and all these other kinds of things where you can get your Python installation going. But WordPress comes with so many of these ISP you know solutions that if you want to do a, a website, it's like that's kind of like the first installation that they have. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where a lot of people are, are potentially sitting right now. So that's that's kind of a cool solution. I think one of the one of the really positive developments over the last couple of years has been that people realize that how do I summarize this? That people realize that you can basically just take one tool to some degree and then stop using a tool at a certain point. Right? There's this idea that you can you can use WordPress for editing, but then it's okay to like not use WordPress for rendering, right? Or this idea. Right. Like this, this, uh, it used to be really like frowned upon that one would sort of s- scrape, screen grab some stuff 
it's like, oh, yeah. I have this tool and now it renders some stuff. And then you go with regular expressions over it to get some data out to do something else with it. That that was like really, really, really like frowned upon. I was like, I ran a lot of PHP projects that just made an HTTP request to another website and then just re repackaged the data and rendered it as their own. Like kind of like a new aggregator or something. Yeah, yeah, stuff like this. And but nowadays, if you actually consider how 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 the web works, it's, that's pretty much what the web is now. It's like Google goes to Wikipedia to scrape some stuff out and then render it in their own box, or <laughs> Siri goes to everywhere right. to scrape the stuff and do it, like and and get things out for you. Right? This is this is no longer like bad. This is just how stuff works. Yeah. And there are lots of websites that just are a front to a wide range of backend APIs. And some of those backend APIs are literally just static JSON files produced through some thing. Yeah. Right. This is this is no longer ugly and terrible. This is just acceptable. Yeah. So I think this is this is a reasonable development. Yeah. Well I kind of in the data science world, like a, a, a lot of the government sites, at least the one for where I live in Colorado. In the Colorado government site, they serve a lot of the data that you, if you're interested in it as just JSON, like you're saying. Yeah, this is actually one of the best developments of JavaScript on the front end. I, yeah. especially during the coronavirus times, I went to like a lot of websites to, to, to get to their data because I was really curious. And typically they're just in a JSON file somewhere. It's great. Way better than the days where you had to like yeah. scrape and then do regexes to extract data from a, yeah. from a HTML page. Yeah, where it's already rendered out in HTML and then having to like completely <laughs> walk through it. Yeah. And then maybe the like oh. pagination where you have to like yeah. click through the whole time. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about just general about uh, gaming. Are, do you play video games? I don't know if that was partly why you got into that world. Selectively, I would say I, 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 I appreciate the technology about games always more than 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 playing like single player games, this kind of thing. Okay. I do really like well, I, I used to really like multiplayer games like um okay. like Dota, League of Legends, uh Quake, Counter Strike, that sort of stuff, Battlefield. But I, I play so little recently. Okay. Uh yeah. I just yeah. don't have the time anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I understand. It's kind of surprising. My wife is totally into video games and when I Said you were you had worked on part you know portions of the Halo uh, Master Chief collection. She's like, what? <laughs> she got real excited. So yeah, it's that's like her um, her way of kind of like relaxing at the end of the day is going and playing Destiny and just like <laughs> yeah, the, just batching really. What I actually really liked about looking on that project in particular is because so the, the when the game released on the Xbox, it was actually just all the individual games into individual executables and this master uh, executable round which just yeah like swapped out for the individual ones and we were basically just tasked with making sure that this the swapping experience and the matchmaking and then calling into the in, in passing all the state into the inner ones works but i i remember i spent like probably like a couple of weeks all the evenings just reading through all the source code of the old of the old halos because i found it just fascinating oh wow where, where it came from because like they were built on top of each other and they had like years and years of experience i i actually got more joy out of huh. out of studying the source code than than from like <laughs> playing the games even though they're great yeah that was a question i had recently from somebody that they said they were like an intermediate developer and they use this analogy of a child having reader books that are designed for certain levels of reading and he was wondering if there were certain projects that I could suggest that would be at, you know, a specific reader level that would be good for him to kind of continue to develop his, his skills. And I, I, you know, I mentioned Flask, but you know, there are other projects and stuff like that. And I don't know if you had a suggestion of like, you know, Python projects that you could think of it or would be a good read for someone um, to go through the source code. It's a tough question because like Flask is just pretty boring. Vectric is pretty boring. Clicker is, is even more boring. Like these are all just not very. Yeah. They, these are all just suboptimal libraries for learning because, like, you, you learn something, but I don't know if if that's valuable. It's probably more. Into, I, I don't know. I. I feel like you have to read something with a purpose. <laughs> okay. Like, 
either you read a story and then it's like the purpose is learning what's what's coming behind what, what's like what's on the next page but typically there is no narrative in a in a python project so that that falls away so then you have to go to actually okay learning something specific like how does i don't know seasons work or something like this and and then it's like okay then you need to figure out first like what does interest you and then you probably like once you've figured out what interests you then you should pick the most compact implementation of the thing that interests you uh and not the most uh like fancy and evolved one i don't know it's it's just a super generic answer but i really don't know anything right now that i can suggest here yeah that makes sense did we cover what you wanted to cover in Flask? You had a question earlier, which was like, what would I have done differently? I don't think I would have done anything technically too different. Probably some things, but yeah. that's sort of debatable. I for sure would have done one aspect differently, which is sort of the community around it. I underappreciated a how big it, it gets. Oh, okay. And also how much time and effort an open source project can take when it gets to a certain size. And size not measured by number of lines of code, but just the amount of people using it. Mm. And I never really want to spend time of the, on this right. to a big fault, which is that I also didn't spend time on even thinking that I would have to deal with this eventually. So this this kind of problem doesn't go away unless your users go away. And so... I didn't handle very well how sort of this transition from I hack around on this thing to other people hack around on this thing actually went. So I think that's one of the biggest change that I would do is understanding that you need to spend time on yeah. on figuring out how stuff is supposed to work when you're not involved. Mm. Help direct it in some ways or at least have directives at least at least maybe communicate like why was it built in a way it was built so that other people can understand why it does that and then oh, okay. find out how to give it to other people so that they can do something with it. It's a relatively complex problem, but I hate to use the generic term of like a mission statement, but kind of that sort of Yeah, something like this and and then sort of paired with uh, paired with I wouldn't necessarily call it like interviewing people, but like have conversation with people about like, hey, why why does it interest you? Like, would you want to work on this? Yeah. Like this, the sort of building a community of like-minded people. Mm. Like the Django framework did a really good job in doing that, and I just never felt like that's something that I feel very inspired in doing. But then not doing it mm. also doesn't lead to a satisfying situation. And so it took Flask really a couple of attempts to build this sort of palace community around it. And yeah, and, and now it's there. And I feel like sometimes maybe I should have done certain things differently to have like maybe ingrained some ideas more. Yeah. But then maybe it's like, it shouldn't have been my choice anyways to see how it should go. Is this something you want to refocus now or? No, no, no. no. I think it's, it's fine how it's doing now. It's just, yeah. I, I probably would feel less detached from it if I would have communicated some of my ideas more it's like i feel like it's no longer my fight to make it more backwards compatible for instance oh yeah right this is like the community sees this differently now than i do and so that's fine yeah that makes sense i actually have a question about python in general um and we talked a little bit about type checking what is your thoughts as far as like you know the current trajectory of the language you kind of hinted at it a little bit are there other thoughts you have about the trajectory of python I feel like Python is one of the languages where I wasn't wrong early on about predicting what the core problems are. I feel like the core problems that I felt like the language had when I started using it are exactly the same core problems that it has now, Okay, which is just that the core implementation is ridiculously leaky hmm. and there is only so much you can do to fix that. And as time goes on, that becomes a more and more pressing thing. And so since that's kind of unfixable, it's going to further move into areas where these problems are less of an issue. And I think that's probably also why data science is 
or data processing in general is something where Python is holding strong like this because like when it comes to number crunching and stuff like this, you're kind of moving out of the slow language anyways into sort of things like NumPy, Skippy. Um, right. The C libraries underneath it. Yeah, or or even moving into the GPU. Okay. Um, so then it just becomes like sort of a combining things together kind of area. And and especially many languages in, the, in that environment, like MATLAB and so forth, they're not particularly fast in the language either. They're just fast when it comes to the numeric kernels. So I I feel like I'm more and more convinced that that's where the language lands. I I hope so I, I don't think that the language has a has a has a particularly bright future out of those outside of those communities. I don't think people are going to build massive online services in the future, for instance, because they probably have better languages to pick from nowadays. But I do hope that that in the same way as the language is inspired by, like, if you take Rust, for instance, as a language, Rust didn't ex- come out of nothingness. It was inspired by a lot of other languages. And I think many of the ideas that, that made Python such an amazing language, they are not really acknowledged by many other languages. So a lot of language, other languages that have been designed completely pick different things to focus on. Yeah than the ideas that Python had. And and I really hope that maybe the future of Python is that someone comes in and builds another language mm. that becomes like the Python of its time. And 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 I do hope that that's going to be largely the future that that Python finds itself in, that, that the community or someone else is going to build another language that brings for a new generation what Python brought to mind. So I have a question as far as like, working in Python and, and things that are happening out there. What's something that you're excited about in the world of Python? I'm not seeing that much of what's happening in Python, unfortunately. So it's kind of hard for me to say. Yeah. I think I think I have pretty high hopes that what happens around poetry and Python packaging will yeah. move towards a place that's a little bit more dependable. Pardon the pun. Um, but... Yeah, I think this is sort of the, the biggest area where I'm excited that something can happen. Also, it feels like typing is is moving in in a more stable and 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 useful direction. So I think it's also pretty good. Yeah. And then I mean like in terms of where the Python users are, it's pretty obvious like in the data science world there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um I just don't necessarily know like how much it excites me personally, but right. I find it always interesting to see like what what people build with Python nowadays. Um and and this is just Python has become so commonplace in certain areas that it's just exciting by that. Yeah. It in itself. And I think that's cool. And it's just that I I associate less with those uh those things than yeah. Okay. Than I did with app development. So what's something that you're interested in learning next for yourself? Hmm. Does it have to be programming? No, I don't know. Um, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. <laughs> I I just I I feel like I'm moving a little bit away from like specific programming problems to like either like really interesting technical challenges that uh, that comes through work, or I just generally like learning more about the world. In okay. like as I mentioned, like economics is a thing that interests me. But there's there's a lot. Uh, just about psychology and 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 how humans work and that, like, <laughs> it's such an interesting part they, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Is it also politics interests me a lot? And then like, um, I'm a father, so like, just having kids grow up has become quite a significant part of my life. And yeah. figuring out how you how you handle that aspect of the world, yeah, interests me quite a bit. So I I feel like I'm spending a lot more time in debugging humans than debugging code. <laughs> yeah. Has uh, debugging code helped you with debugging humans? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the reverse would be true either. <laughs> uh, very different problems. Very little. Uh, actually, I think that's, that's a bit of overlap, but yeah, no, it's uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. Like, here's, here's one interesting thing about the programming part for me that has some real world impact uh, to debugging humans, which is that. Yes. <laughs> I grew up as a human, in, in like in an adult human, like this sort of sentient human being that is capable of doing more things than just uh, uh, like saying a bunch of words, has been largely been my programming career. Like I feel like from from f- probably thirteen to I don't know now, um, programming or Python has has shaped me. Right, my understanding of the world is largely based by my my experience in programming, and that is not just like I understand how to write a function, but also because I have been yeah growing up in the open source community in the in the Python open source community specifically. Yeah. All right. So. So my ideas of how the world works has been hugely shaped by work people I interacted with through my work. Um, and so I think that's the interesting part because like especially if you're in, in, in the open source community, you have an idea about how the world ideally works. And then maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. You have, you have uh, political ideas that are shaped by, uh, by, by people you interact with. Um, you get a much broader sense of, of what's out there. Like, if I wouldn't have started programming in Python in the open source community, I probably wouldn't have interacted with so many people from different countries, different cultures, um, different ideas about um, things. I wouldn't have seen so many places. And yeah, I think that's also interesting because like yeah. in, in that way, programming shaped my ability to understand humans. I don't know, maybe if I would have been an assembly programmer that would have been different um, because <laughs> sure, more solo. it seems less of a community <laughs> kind of experience. Um, but the, the Python community is is a very diverse one. Um, it, it, it had and still has like the desire to do things right. Maybe it doesn't always achieve it, but the idea is there. That's, that's quite interesting. And I think um, definitely character shaping. Yeah, you've done a lot of talks um, in the, you know, speaking of the Python community, going out to events and things like that. I know right now <laughs> it's not really happening. Do you have plans to do any of that sort of stuff online? Uh, I want to, to be honest. I just. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a good excuses for not doing it. Um, the, 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 for me, the big problem is like, and this is like this is it's kind of funny because it's, it's the same problem right now is that people invite me to a Python podcast and I was like, well, <laughs> how much how much relevance do I still have to the Python community, right? If if it's like if people ask me to talk about something with Rust, I'm like they're way more capable people than than me to to get you to uh, to to talk about something. Uh, so it's really quite funny. Sure, I I feel like. A couple of years ago, there was like there was a good reason to have at the conference. Now I feel like it's uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe I'm not not the not, not the right person to have there. It's sort of uh, what do you call this? Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I feel like a little bit misplaced sometimes at Python conferences now. Like uh, if, especially if you look at the last couple of talks I gave about it, about well, it's like very 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 meta. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that. You're, you're kind of talking about, that's why I asked you those questions about like, you know, where you feel the trajectory of the languages and some of your ideas for that and what you liked about these other languages and, and so forth. And I, I feel like, you know, as programmers, our whole goal is to solve problems. And I mean, obviously that's where you started too. It's like, that's where Flash started is you were, you wanted to solve your own problem and, and kind of going on top of that. And so, yeah. So one thing I learned is that I'm a lot less attached to communities now than I used to be. I remember. Um, okay. So I don't know remember when it happened, but I, I remember um, uh, there, there was a guy. He has a real name too, but his online handle was Why the Lucky Stiff. He was a, a programmer that was very active in the Ruby community, and he he was very peculiar, to put it mildly. Okay. What was the name again? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. So his online handle was Why the Lucky Stiff. He has a real name, um, but he was he 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 was very peculiar about like not really revealing too much about himself. But he made all these comics. He had also he had also had the one file framework, 
uh, I think it was, was it called Campfire. I forgot what it's called. But he he was like very out there. And then from one day to another, he deleted all his stuff and disappeared. And I found this fascinating because I couldn't imagine that. I couldn't imagine like you, this, this, this most, one of the most influential people in this community. And then it would just mm. disappear and <laughs> not be seen again. And then at the same time, I feel like I, I probably could have disappeared from the Python community and it wouldn't have changed much because in a way I already yeah. didn't feel like I'm sort of the person that should represent it because I don't feel like such a emotional attachment to it in the first place. And so like now that I'm doing like a lot of Rust, I feel it's an awesome community, but at the same time, I, I keep a lot more distant now hmm. because I, I don't know if, if I'm going to be interested in Rust in five years, right? I don't want to become... A luminary or whatever. Yeah, or, or even just... Like, I don't even know if programming is going to be something that interests me in five years, right? So maybe it's just something else entirely. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, the problem is also that... I, there's so many people that ask that sent you an email and then ask like, "Hey, I want to do X. Like, how do I do it?" And but X being sort of a, like a life l- lesson in life for how to become a good program or something. And quite honestly, I have no clue. Yeah. Because I, I I just I did some stuff. Maybe that worked. Maybe maybe it doesn't. I I can't like even uh, justify why I did certain things in my own life in a certain way. Right. I, I feel like this is. I can't give reasonable advice to others. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I understand. And and I always feel really awkward in, in when 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 I'm being sort of asked to 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 sort of give this some sort of visionary ideas or 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 suggestions about how to run your own life. It's like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so that I think that's that's one of the limiting factors of me now doing talks is that. At the, at the, I don't have practical advice in the Python world anymore because I don't do enough. And then when it comes to these visionary things, I feel like, uh, <laughs> I don't know if, <laughs> yeah. if I'm even supposed to have a voice here anymore. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and talking to me about all this stuff. I, I, <laughs> I learned a ton. You know, I definitely appreciate all the stuff you've added. And I think you've built quite a cool community and you know, your palettes, projects. That's awesome. So I want to thank you again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I want to thank Armin Ronaher for talking to me on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.